Hello everyone and welcome to Co-op's Empowering Arts and Culture. Uh, it's a webinar brought to you by the Business Support for Co-op's programme and the programme is delivered by Cooperatives UK in partnership with Cooperative Bank. It offers tailored support to startup and existing co-ops and it's one of a series of webinars to introduce people to co-ops and signpost the support that they can get to start a co-op and certainly arts and culture is an area that's absolutely prime for more co-ops. So what we're going to cover in uh, today's seminar, <clears throat> when I can move the slide along, here we go. So what we're going to cover is uh, what is a cooperative? an introduction, uh, how co-ops can empower people and organisations in the arts and cultural sectors, with examples from myself, Terry Tildesley. I'm a music and tech consultant, creative technologies producer and musician. And we've got Matthew Oatridge, founder of music venue The Exchange in Bristol and ownership coordinator for Music Venue Trust. And Pat O'Shea, who's a member of the Ultimate Picture Palace, a community owned cinema in Oxford. And we'll talk about the support available from Cooperatives UK's Business Support for Co-ops programme to help you start a co-op. There will also be a question and answer session to close, so there's going to be plenty of time for that. Okay, so what is a cooperative? Um, well, a cooperative is a business or an organisation that's owned and controlled by its members to meet their shared needs. They're not owned by shareholders who may not even be in the same country, uh, who hold the power and take profits out of the business with little or no involvement in actually running the business. And what it means is that people who are closest to the business are the ones to benefit from the business's success, the co-op's success. And those members can be customers, employees, residents, suppliers, audiences, listeners. Uh, there's lots of different kinds of customers in the, the culture sector. Uh, it also means that co-ops don't just focus on making a profit, they focus on how they make it. And that's something that's really important, the, the kind of values and the ethics, if you like, uh, what they do with a profit and how they bring value to their members and their community. And cooperatives can be pubs, energy suppliers, music venues, taxi firms, bookshops, farmers, sports clubs and uh, I even know of a new co-op that's a promoter co-op in Birmingham so there's lots of different varieties. In the UK there are 7,000 cooperatives that's um, a part of more than 3 million cooperatives globally and in the UK co-ops contribute over 40 billion to the UK economy so they're really really important to the economy. And something that's been very interesting um, through recent research and obviously all the very difficult pandemic times is uh, the proof that co-ops are resilient. So they were five times less likely to close down in 2021 than UK businesses generally. So that's a, a really important thing. And cooperatives are proven vehicles for collective action, enabling people to achieve more together than they can on their own. And I think we'll be um, hearing about that from our guests and from some examples that I'll be telling you about in a minute. Now, the key thing about co-ops is members are the foundation of every co-op. It's why they exist. Um, they can be uh, customers, uh, employees, residents, suppliers, and they all have a say in how the co-op is run. And members put something in and get something out, uh, and that can vary. So each member contributes but receives something in return. Um, they could contribute time working for the co-op, investing in the co-op, uh, shopping or trading with the co-op. And any surplus made after all the costs are covered can be shared between the members. It's sometimes known as the dividend, uh, or it can be reinvested back into the co-op. Members have an equal say. This is really important. That's a very kind of democratic kind of thing, a co-op. 
So how can co-ops empower arts and culture? Well, I'm sure we all know about squeezed funding, digitization, and there are many creatives in unstable freelance work. Um, so sustaining careers, spaces, venues, opportunities and morale can be a real challenge in the arts and cultural industries. And that's where co-ops can help. When people come together to form co-ops, they can empower creativity, create work opportunities, preserve vital spaces for the communities, and provide support that empowers individuals to thrive within their chosen field of work. I'm going to give you some examples of co-ops um, in areas you might not have thought of before, before we come to our guests. So first of all, there's a cooperative called Felt Nout, and it's a, a really interesting arts co-op. Um, so it's a northeast based co-op of comedians who formed to give local stand-ups more work. So they wanted to create the right kind of gig economy in the area. And in 2022, they generated £60,000 worth of paid work for comedians. They gave work to 70 acts in 18 venues and gave eight comics their first paid gig. So bringing on new generations of comics and uh, includes 57 comedian members with benefits. They get free headshots as part of membership, uh, free comedy writing workshops, new acts nights to bring on people as comedians and free use of podcasting facilities, which uh, I mean, a different cultural area, but that sounds like a, a brilliant package to me. Uh, and then let's take a quick look at Crescent Management. Now, it's an actors co-op, and uh, there are many actors co-ops throughout the UK, and they act as agencies for their members. They submit them for roles and negotiating fees and contracts. And the actors usually commit to a set amount of days each month working at the agency and acting as the agent for their colleagues, which seems like a good idea. It's so hard to represent yourself, I think. So to have someone acting as your agent is fantastic. Um, so their benefits of membership, full transparency and decision making in the process of submitting for acting roles, which actors don't have with traditional agents. In a co-op, they're much more in control of how they're represented. And again, we'll be hearing more about transparency during the webinar. Actor members work as agents for each other, which develops their connections in the industry and gives them greater insight into how it works. So network building comes with being a member. And connection and support from other actors within the agency in what is a highly competitive business. And I can imagine sometimes it's quite an isolated business as well. So to have that extra support must be very valuable. So those are a couple of examples, but what I'm going to do now is hand over to Pat from the Ultimate uh, Picture Palace. There we go. So this is the story of the Ultimate Picture Palace uh, cinema in Oxford, which um, opened in 1911, one of the first cinemas in the country. It's had a bit of a checkered history over the over 100 years, 100 and, over 111 years that it's been in existence. Um, and it's only very recently been uh, become a community owned cinema just in just two months ago, um, having been pr a privately owned business. So it's an example of a, a cultural uh, venue that's moved from being privately owned by one individual to being owned by the community. And I'm going to try and tell that story. It's the only independent cinema in Oxford. Um, it's uh, what's called a second run cinema, which means it shows um, films two or three weeks after they've been released into mainstream cinema so people can come and see them um, if they miss them first time round or you know they because they want to uh, uh, patronize their local independent cinema uh, this is a oh i'll have to move on the slides there we go that's what it looked like at one point earlier in its futures probably i should think that's probably the 20s or 30s wouldn't you looking at those hats so i was just saying a little bit about the context of the UPP, it's on the Cowley Road, very vibrant, very lively part of Oxford, uh, very diverse. It's where um, many of our global minority communities live and um, the, the street is lined with 
food stalls from uh, representing cultures all around the world. I mean, it has got a Tesco's and a Boots, but it's also got a couple of sex shops, um, lots of bars and restaurants, cafes. And in the bottom right there, you can see the annual Cowley Road Carnival underway, great event. So it's a really vibrant bit of the city. Um, and, and so um, what happened, uh, uh, sorry. Um, so what happened was that the cinema had gone through, as I said, checkered history. In 2011, it was bought by um, a, a woman called Becky Hogsmith, who ran it as a, a, a she was a passionate about the cinema, um, was able to restore it, get it going, run it as a really interesting, lively cinema um, throughout that decade, but sadly very died, uh, died before her time in 2018. And in her will, she expressed a wish that the cinema should become a community asset, but without any detail about how that was actually going to happen. So the executors of her will um, got together a group of people, of which I was one, uh, volunteers, um, to try and work out how this could happen and to, and to try and make it happen. So we looked into various options. Um, as a group, we decided we, we, we didn't want to be a charity because we wanted to continue to run it as a business. We wanted it to be a cooperative for all the reasons that Terry has already explained, um, to, sh to sell shares into the uh, community. And um, so we decided, we looked at, there's a couple of options. There was one, there's one called a community interest, uh, oh God, what it's, what's it called? Anyway, we decided on becoming a, um, a community benefit society. That was the model we chose. Um, and it's, it was ultimately the way of saving the, the venue. Um, um, so we became a community benefit society and we had help in, in this process. It was a formal process. We had help from the uh, Plunkett Foundation, who helped us to set up our model rules in, in keeping with their advice, and also a lot of help from cooperative uh, futures. What we wanted to do was to promote those uh, cooperative values and community values and to serve our diverse community even better uh, by broadening the audience base, broadening the kind of programme that we were going to offer. So to get us going, we had some help from the co-op cooperative Power to Change Community Shares Booster, who um, we had to make applications. We got £10,000 from them. We also got uh, £15,000 rather from Social Investment Business, uh, the REACH Fund. Um, so we had £25,000 um, fairly early on to help with the costs of getting the share offer going, doing the work, paying for the survey of the building, um, the dilapidation survey, the valuations, the legal work and all of that kind of thing. We did incidentally have a former lawyer on our committee who proved to be absolutely invaluable. He, he was a human rights lawyer, but nevertheless, he was sufficiently au fait with the legal framework to really help us. So that £25,000 that we got at the beginning was really, really helpful. Um, uh, and all the way through this process of work of putting our share offer together, we were guided by, we were aiming at two, um, two things. We wanted to achieve two things to give ourselves the confidence that we were doing it well, that we were doing it with high quality. And one of them was that we were working towards the cooperatives, community shares, standard mark, where the criteria are really clear and detailed as to what your share offer should look like. Um, it, it sets standards for high quality share offer documents, which are clear, honest, and transparent and ensure that investors have all the facts they need to make an informed decision and that these facts are supported by annual accounts and or a business plan. So we were aiming to get that and that helped us make sure that all our work was, of, of, of that, uh, was gonna meet that standard. There was some money in it as well, but that wasn't the only motivation. And the other thing we were aiming for was to get what we became, we came 
familiarly to know as CITA or social investment tax relief. And again, if we met certain criteria um, through HMRC, all of our investors could get 30% tax relief on their investments. So those were sort of guiding um, aims that we were trying to work towards. So there was a lot of work. I don't want to underestimate the amount of, um, of work that went into creating the business plan and the share offer document. These were the two key documents that we needed to produce in order to launch our share offer. Um, we decided to use FX uh, platform to manage our share offer. It's an ethical investment program and it happens to be based just across the road from the cinema, although it, it, it does work nationally. But they were there, they were very, very helpful um, and supportive with giving us guidance and advice and then hosting the share offer when we finally came to launch it. So we worked with that startup money and the advice to work out what a business plan would look like. There was a lot of detailed financial work in there, um, financial analysis of the trading situation of the cinema in previous years, and also projections as to how the business might run if and when it was successful in becoming a community um, community owned business. And also we had to produce a share offer document which uh, was going to, a more accessible document for people deciding whether or not to invest. Um, and as you can see from the cover there of, of uh, our share offer document, the target was £312,000 plus. Um, that was based on the value of the business, not the building. The, it's a listed building. Um, which the cinema leases from the freeholders. And um, we had a minimum uh, amount that we would raise, which would enable us to buy the business, but not much more. Our target amount and a maximum amount, which would allow us to buy the business and do some improvements, which I'll say something about uh, in a moment. So we also got preferred bidder status, which meant that the executors of Becky Holsmith's will would would give us first option to buy it if we could raise this money and this was a lot of work a lot of detailed work from a, a, a group of volunteers on this committee um i'll just say at this point i got into this because um i'm very keen on film i just finished a, ma a master's in film studies and and the the uh, person who put the group together was a friend and knew that uh, all of this work was nothing to do with film at all it was all to do with communications with the Financial Conduct Authority, um, model rule, business plan, and so on. Okay, so we became, after about two years of this preparation, we were ready to launch. And that was in the spring of 2020. And then of course, two major hurdles um, hit us. The first was COVID, which hopefully won't happen again, but closed the cinema down for months and then had periods of closure and opening and mainly partial opening. And of course, this threw all our financial projections into, uh, into chaos. And we had to wait until the cinema could fully reopen and that we could demonstrate that financially it was secure again before we could um, get ready to launch again. So our second move towards launch we then hit another problem which again was probably a one-off for us but it was to do with the lease because unbeknownst to us we were the lease was of the UPP limited the, the privately owned cinema was just coming up for renewal we'd been involved in negotiating a new lease with the freeholders which we were about to sign and it would be handed over to the community cinema when we uh, even when we took over the cinema, but unbeknownst to us, the freehold was sold um, to another freeholder who was one of the Oxford colleges and their approach to the lease was very different. So it took months and months of um, negotiation to try and get them to offer a lease which would be, which we could confidently offer to potential um, community shareholders that was long enough uh, and secure enough to do that. So that was a big problem. But we did manage to get over those hurdles and we were finally ready to launch our share offer in April 2022. 
Um, we had decided that to keep the shares very low, one pound per share, but with a minimum of 50 pounds for all investors or 30 pounds if you were under 30 or lived in the, one of the adjacent postcodes. We had a highly democratic structure, as Terry has already said, so one member, one vote. So whether you bought 30 pounds worth of shares or 20,000 pounds worth of shares, and that was our maximum, so we, we didn't want it to be dominated by big, uh, big contributions, um, you have one vote as a member of the society, that's member with a capital M. So we then had a huge launch, lots of excitement, publicity. We employed somebody for a few days over a period of months to, to set this up for us, um, local radio, local television, national uh, press, and, and quite a few stars as well. So we had um, Sam Mendes, who's local to us and was interested, Pippa Harris of BAFTA, Hugh Bonneville, uh, Peter Bradshaw came down and introduced a film, and Richard Curtis, um, director of uh, uh, Love Actually and all those other films, did a little video from his home um, at supporting us in which he talked about the crucial influence that small independent cinemas have in providing platforms for independent film. So we finally launched in April 22, as I said, and uh, we made the maximum of our target a few days before the share offer was due to close. So we had to, we closed the share offer, we'd made our maximum, and um, we had over 1300 investors uh, from, the, from the local community. Um, and as I said, reached the target before the closing date. So we now have over 1300 members of the Community Benefit Society which is the UPP, the Ultimate Picture Palace Community Cinema, which has been up and running as that for two months. Uh, so I can't really say much about what's, uh, how, how it's doing, although I'll say a little bit more at the end. So because we raised our maximum target, it meant that we could uh, make some improvements to, in, to improve access in particular. Um, there is no accessible loo on site. We have to use one in a, another institution across the road. So we'll be able to do that. We are able to provide a safe access to the projection room. At the moment, it's a very rickety ladder. We will improve the ticket office, the bar area in the website, invest in some technology, and you can see that the seats are not very well raked. So we're going to improve that so that if you sit behind a very tall person, you'll still be able to see the film. So um, that's our little bar that's inside the cinema. Uh, so I, like most of our members, we ha uh, have now stepped down from the committee because as you can see, it's been four years of quite extensive work to get to where we are now. Um, we had our first annual members meeting in November and two or three members have continued onto the committee to provide some continuity, but we put quite a lot of uh, care into encouraging people to stand for election to the committee. We had quite a lot of candidates and we've got a new committee with new energy, new ideas and quite a good range of skills because we knew we needed legal expertise, financial expertise, probably marketing, probably HR expertise in the, in the committee. So we've, we've got, we think we've got that range. Um, part of the, um, the transfer was to, um, uh, we, tu we tupid transfer of public undertakings, all the employees, are, their, their employment has continued, we've upgraded the director who runs the, the, the place from day to day, and the, the uh, program manager, their job descriptions have been enhanced, their salaries improved, so we've further professionalised them, um, and so jobs have been saved, um, upgraded, and the cinema is thriving. So I've stepped down from the committee, as I say, but I am now a volunteer um, and I staff that little bar um, on a Thursday afternoon. I'm going down after this to run the bar, make tea, serve homemade cakes, um, pour wine and so on. We have had mulled wine up until just recently. Um, and 
uh, then to watch the film Tar with the wonderful Kate Blanchett um, as part of my volunteer work there. So, so I'm still involved um, and the cinema is uh, launched as a community asset. So I'm gonna stop there and I can take some questions later. Good, okay. So um, just to recap very briefly on what I was saying earlier. Uh, so when Cooperatives UK were speaking to us about um, being participants and doing a presentation, they were quite keen to hear about our, our sort of journeys towards cooperatives, how we got into them in the first place. So I'll tell you briefly about mine and then talk to you a bit more about Resonate, which is an ethical music streaming cooperative. So I've got quite a few different hats in music. Uh, I'm a musician, a producer, uh, I play grassroots venues. Uh, I also produce events as well, like uh, Music Tech Fest, now known as MTF Labs. Uh, I do some speaking, including at Cooperatives Congress, and um, some mentoring. I started a, um, a music website to try and give female artists more exposure, particularly around their craft and the uh, producing side of it. So quite a 360 view of the music industry and uh, have recognized like most people in it that there's a lot that needs to change about the industry. Um, I'm also a member of a, a group called 2% Rising which is a group for uh, women and non-binary producers and recording engineers. So very aware that historically uh, the music industry has been very exploitative and it would be a very good thing if we can create new structures to, to create a fairer ecosystem. So while I was at uh, Music Tech Fest in Berlin, I met some of the team behind Resonate and I swiftly joined as an artist. And it's a cooperative music streaming platform owned and run by members. Uh, I joined in 2016, so quite early days, and they we had a very small uh, crowdfunder around that time to get uh, some funds together to turn a proof of concept, if you like, into something more proper. Now, Resonate is quite a different thing from um, some more local co-ops. It's a platform cooperative. And what that means is it's online. So it's like other software platforms that you might be using, except it's streaming. So it's international. It has music on it from uh, almost every country in the world, which is very exciting. And it's a really big project, um, technically, cooperatively, ethically. Uh, there's a lot going on at Resonate. So um, after some time, I was invited to stand for the board and I was elected a board member and eventually chair of the cooperative. So I was chair for a couple of years and I benefited hugely from Co-ops UK directors training. Uh, it was great to see how other cooperatives were set up and get a sense of, well, more than a sense, um, training in best practice in uh, working at a cooperative. Um, and then with board renewal and also wanting to focus on, uh, on my upcoming album, uh, I stepped back and now I'm an artist member, but not involved in the core team. So what drew me to resonate was um, I found it really inspiring and I really liked the values and what they were setting out to try and do, which was to create a fairer ecosystem for artists, um, especially around streaming. Um, artists are, are very um, exploited, they get very little money, even artists with millions of streams, um, have, you know, get very little in return. And that's really come to the fore um, during the pandemic when other sources of income for artists, uh, such as playing shows were was much much more cut off than usual so um so the technical term for how resonates set up is a multi-stakeholder cooperative uh, so in our case that means the stakeholders the the groups that share and organize share in the co-op and organize it are artists listeners and workers and um the artists actually get the biggest share um, and workers includes both paid workers and also volunteers. There's a, a sort of mechanism, which I'll, I'll explain a little bit later about that. So um, 
Yes, so just to pick up on something I mentioned earlier, um, creative industries have a very bad record for exploiting people, and I think in music, perhaps more than many others. Um, so to be part of something that's trying to change things is a very exciting thing to do. And one of the things about co-ops is you can hardwire your values into how you work, and not just around payment, but around all sorts of other things. Um, just this week, there's an artist called Miri, and she gave an interview to Attack magazine. They interviewed a group of artists who had taken their music off Spotify, and they came back to them this week, one year on, to see how they were doing. And Miri's got her music on a few different platforms, but had something really nice to say about Resonate. And she said they seem to be going from strength to strength and building their community. And obviously that's a key thing from cooperatives, uh, the community. So with Resonate being a platform cooperative, the community is online, there's a community forum, and people can uh, take part in discussions, make suggestions, vote on certain things. So that will happen as part of the forum. And when it comes to uh, money, and uh, Resonate is completely transparent about the finances, about pricing, about what artists get. Um, and that's something that you don't really see anywhere else. Um, in fact, a leading streaming platform that I won't name, uh, basically you stream, the money goes into a huge pot and then they kind of divide it up behind closed doors and you don't know that the money um, that you've put in is necessarily going to pay the artist to, that you listen to. Um, so I'll elaborate on that in a little minute, but um, so pricing. So with Resonate, it's, uh, you join as a member. There's a, a small membership fee. It's not a, a subscription. You buy credits and it's like pay as you go. Um, and one of the other things that's hardwired into the way Resonate works is a commitment to a uh, privacy and not selling your data because a lot of um, commercial platforms they do sell your data on and that's you know why you get targeted ads and it, you feel like they're listening in on you and that kind of thing um, so many different kinds of values are hired hard wired in there um, and Yes, yeah, so it's pay as you play, no monthly subscription, and they've even invented a whole new way of paying the artists, which is called stream to own. Um, so it's a kind of form, it's a form of micropayments, really. And if you can see just at the top um, on the right, so there's a, um, a track that's uploaded called Reclaim These Streets by Loud Women, which is an amazing, it's like a sort of feminist punk band-aid. It was a, a track to raise money for uh, end violence against women. Um, so when I'm actually on it, that's why I got even got a bit distracted for a minute, <laughs> remembering that epic moment. So you can see a dot in the right-hand corner. And when you play a track, um, one of the dots, goes dark and that signifies that your payment has been registered and then after you've played track nine times you've paid the equivalent of a download so that in the future you can actually download and own that track but it's wonderfully transparent so you as a listener can see oh yes you know my play has actually registered for this artist um, and when it comes to payouts um, it's still early days in Resonate but artists that are getting payments are getting paid I think the current rate is about six times as much as Spotify uh, it could even be more than that so um, everything's you know very clear on the site and um, that's what when we're talking about cooperative benefits um, well, in this case, it's not like a shopping discount or something, but the listeners know that uh, they've got a direct relationship with the artist in that their money is going to that particular artist. Now, one of the things about being in the creative industry and being a cooperative and having values that are very clear is that um, you attract other people who believe in things like, you know, a fairer ecosystem, 
sustainable careers for artists and so on. And Resonate has had some great support. This is a photo of an in conversation I hosted a couple of years ago at the Great Escape Festival. Um, and we had the amazing Grammy award winning artist and producer Imogen Heap and Matt Black, who uh, was a founding member of Cold Cut and founded the Ninja Tune label. And Resonate's done a, a development project with Imogen for her artist app. Um, uh, called the Creative Passport, and Matt Black has got some of his cold cut tunes on Resonate. Um, and there are a lot of opportunities in Creative Co-ops, especially, I think, to share resources. Um, Resonate's been developing some open source tools that are open to other cooperatives, but also to think about a sort of end-to-end -end experience. So, for example, I mean, we're not there yet, but you could have something like, um, you know, you could buy tickets through a cooperative and go to a cooperative venue and stream the tracks on a cooperative and get a, a cooperative cab home. Do you know what I mean? So, so there's lots of potential there, I think, for that kind of thing. Um, and also in terms of organisations wanting to support, Resonate's had a lot of support from a US organisation called Black Socialists in America, because they feel that Resonate's values align closely with theirs and um, some of their members come and do bits of uh, development work and, and so on. Um, Part of the ecosystem is recognizing that in music it's not just about the audio and resonate um, uh, is designing ways to make sure that um, release artwork gets displayed well and also has uh, label pages um, so that labels that are often the you know brilliant curators and talent spotters also get the get the credit and a presence on the site. Um, this is a photo of a, a Resonate Volunteers meeting a little while ago, and it was um, used in an article, I think, for the Unfound Accelerator. Um, so Resonate has uh, some paid staff, but also relies on volunteers, which uh, hopefully will change. But under the stakeholder system, their work gets kind of counted and they get a share in future profits as well and we have volunteers from all over the world um, whether it's helping with uh, some coding or uh, social media that kind of thing um, we also sometimes when a high profile artist um, has a new release on resonate we get an influx of their fans and that's very exciting there's uh, an american artist who's also a comedian called zach fox and every time he does something we get lots of his fans coming to the volunteer meetings so that shows us a very sort of direct relationship there um now one of the things i think resonate has done i mean it's still building there still needs to be a mobile app there's there's lots more to do but there is a fully functioning player so you can join up and start listening today if you want to but i think resonate has really um changed the debate about around streaming because it's been going for quite a long time now and i think it helped create the foundations for some great campaigns that have come more recently like the broken record campaign um some of you who are sort of musicians or know about music may have heard of it but for those who don't it's a campaign for a fairer streaming system and various music organizations in the UK have come together to try and make things happen and um, they've done brilliantly they actually managed to get a um, an inquiry working with some MPs from the um, parliamentary DCMS committee. So there's been a music streaming inquiry and Resonate contributed some evidence to that. Um, it contributed a, a survey of members, what they want to see. It contributed um, a, a sort of details about the co-op to show how cooperative streaming could be really beneficial. And it also contributed some policy ideas as well. Now, I think not every co-op is going to want to be so big or international. Not every co-op is going to want to campaign in a big way. Um, although I think by being a co-op, you are campaigning. But I think I can say definitely that um, Resonate just shows how 
empowering cooperatives can be in terms of uh, changing the way people work, in terms of enabling people's contributions, and also trying to um, change the way business is done. So that's my contribution. And I'm going to stop the screen share. And I would like to hand over to Matt, who's uh, from the Exchange in Bristol, and also um, part of Music Venue Trust, which is an organisation I think does fantastic work. And I've, the past few years, I've been volunteering on Music Venues Day to, to help out. Oh, great. Nice. OK, let's get in. Third time's a charm. Um, and then I'll press the right button this time, which is slideshare. Great. Uh, thanks, Terry. So yeah, I'm Matthew Utridge. I'm one of the founders of Exchange in Bristol, which is a community benefit society. And I also work for Music Venue Trust as the ownership coordinator. And part of my work at the moment is to manage the Music Venue Properties Project, which is another community benefit society. So I'm going to try to breeze through this because I'm conscious of time. So here's the exchange. It's here in Bristol. Um, it's four floors. There's a lot going on there. Um, it's primarily a grassroots music venue. Here's a picture of a band playing. Um, <laughs> so the bands who've played there, it's 10 years old now, or it was last year, it'll be 11 this year. Um, bands who played there over the years include Haim, Rag and Bone Man, the 1975, um, Idols. Um, in fact, the Idols um, bassist was the bar manager there for, for many years. So um, it goes to show about that grassroots music ecosystem, which we've, uh, which Terry picked up on as well, about how it all feeds into one another. And I got a nice slide about that right at the end of the presentation. So, um, but as well as being a grassroots music venue, um, it's also a vegan cafe. It has, I don't have a photo of it, but an anarchist bookshop in the uh, first floor. It also has a record shop on the first floor and it has a recording studio in the basement. Um, so it's a place that with a lot of um, interesting, creative, musical things going on, um, as a lot of grassroots music venues do, um, we to keep diversifying. Um, but yeah, primarily, you know, we, we can consider ourselves a grassroots music venue, um, you know, we're putting on gigs up to what well, I don't know I think we probably do about five six hundred a year because we have two stages um we also have um DJs and club nights and producers on the weekends often following the gig sometimes daytime events as well so there's a a lot a lot of uh gigs going on down there a lot of uh, creative opportunities um so with the exchange um the story is there is that uh, I used to actually own another venue beforehand called the Croft in Bristol which uh closed in 2013 um we own that on a lease uh which we uh, which was good it, you know it was the venue that I kind of grew up in it was a venue that I was working at for many years before I got the opportunity to to buy the lease but we could see the writing was on the wall it was um a common problem for music venues is that they move into parts of the inner city where people don't necessarily want to be and then make those parts of the city cool so the developers come in and follow them and uh, then suddenly you can't afford to be there anymore so with seeing that we we took the opportunity to move over to a different part of Bristol which uh, you know 10 years later has very much gentrified but this time uh, we actually um, took on the ownership of the building which secured our long-term future uh, but we did that as individuals um, which which has been really positive um, but we did realize as the years went on um, that it wasn't necessarily the complete solution to the problem because we were all getting a bit older we were sort of being pulled in different directions as as the three of us um, so at around this point um, we happened to notice um, so this is probably 2017 what uh, Le Pub in uh, Newport were doing and I know Sam's in the uh, chat today um, which was they'd just become a community benefit society and we read up about it and made sense to us and it it appealed to us a great deal um, because not just to an idea that we could raise some capital to make the venue even better but the idea of longevity for years to come that the venue could almost um you know outlive us as directors if you will so um yeah so basically we, we looked into that at the time we were actually a community interest company so we'd already decided that our activity was really not for profit and it was community focused um after years of sort of being a limited company before that and then just understanding well actually we 
what we're all about sits better within that ethos. And again, the natural kind of um, evolution of that was to become a community benefit society. So in 2018, we launched a Save Exchange community share offer. Um, I always sort of feel like it should have probably been called Secure the Long Term Future of Exchange as opposed to Save Exchange. But uh, the community share expert we were dealing with said, uh, better keep it with two words and uh, it probably made more of an impact when people read it. So um, essentially we look to raise £300,000 and that would buy the assets that were there at the moment, um, get a long-term loan, um, a long-term um, lease um, on, on much more favourable terms than would be available in the market. And to be able to just make um, a lot of improvements that would make the business more sustainable, not only economically, but because of the membership structure, um allowing you know that longevity that there'll be other directors who could take over who also invested into the to the idea of what the exchange was and um yeah we looked to raise three hundred thousand pound and uh we were successful in doing that much like um pat we um used effects um we we did charge a little bit more than than the minimum the minimum that pat's um organization charged but um we managed to raise three hundred thousand pound um and the share offer was successful and um yeah that and i guess where my sort of uh experiences with the exchange differ is that was a few years ago so thinking about now um this is a little bit more from the share offer and it shows a bit how uh, how it keeps it accountable with the members and the, we have a members forum as well but the big difference is that i we've got the several years that i follow to talk about what happened you know how those benefits have played out uh you know how how it all worked out after the share offer and it's been really really successful i mean obviously we've had to endure the pandemic as as everybody has but um, even that in itself, going into the pandemic with the assurity of having funds in the bank, knowing that we wouldn't go bankrupt, um, which wasn't the case for a lot of other music venues. And at that time is when I actually started working for Music Venue Trust. And I was supporting a lot of venues who were having you know, terrible difficulties with landlords and what have you. You know, it really highlighted how secure and, um, you know, how our situation was compared compared to others um but during that time and before it we did actually start to sort of um you know take those share the shareholders money that we'd uh, managed to raise um we reopened the basement stage uh we installed lighting and aircon um we put in a new stage on the main room which is not mentioned here we put in a pa we actually put in an accessible toilet on the uh, ground floor, which again, is something that Pat was saying that um, the cinema was going to do. Um, and yeah, we just made vast improvements across the the plate, uh, the whole building. That's just made it way more sustainable, way more successful, and just a much better place to be, really, to be honest. Um, along the way, we've actually received a lot of funding um, which was something, again, that we didn't get before, even when we were a community interest company. Um, uh, we just were never successful in any of the applications we did. But being a community benefit society and also being able to leverage the uh, money that we've raised through the share of, um, offer as being match funding really helped. So like the Arts Council, for example, um, we used some of the share offer money to, to purchase the PA that we put in and the rest came from the Arts Council. Um, recently, we've used the West of England Combined Authority money to install. In fact, the installation is actually happening over the next two weeks, at about 25 um solar panels um in onto the building so that we can be more um uh you know, environmentally friendly moving forward so yeah it's it's been really positive um it's really brought more people to the venue um and yeah it's just our output is just so much better and impressive because of essentially that community share offer and as importantly we now have several people on the board who had nothing to do with the exchange before who are helping to sort of chart the future um the future of the, of the, the business as we move from the point of 
realizing everything that was in the share offer document um, towards um, just the future of, and you know, quite a difficult future <laughs> to be honest. I don't think anybody saw all of these uh, different crises coming. And um, you know, it's good to have a team of people who are sort of you know young and uh, dynamic and you know ready to sort of um, face those challenges head on. So. Um, one big thing I wanted to touch on around the accessibility um, was that uh, because of all of these efforts and just because of as a result of becoming a community benefit society, we actually became the first um, gold um, standard grassroots music venue to achieve the Attitude Seppafin Live Events Access Charter Award. Um, so um, that's just been really, really positive, um, you know, to be a, the first ones to achieve that was was amazing. We've also running a couple of different um, projects, Gig Buddies and uh, Go Gentle, which have made the, the venue more diverse and more accessible and just, um, you know, just supporting different areas of, within the community. Um, yeah, so that's 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 been really good. So um, moving on from the exchange, that was a whirlwind <laughs> stop. Um, I essentially, as I mentioned, during that pandemic, I, I became a member of Music Venue Trust and um, I took my experiences of exchange and said um, to, to the, the people who run it, have you thought, I knew that one of their long-term goals was, was um, the ownership of music venues, not to run them themselves, the complete opposite, just to remove them out of the commercial sector and away from landlords who didn't have the same objectives as the people who ran it. Um, and I suggested, could a community share offer be, be an option? And um, it was an idea that they liked, liked the thought of, um, but obviously that was during a pandemic point. So um, yeah, that was something that we started to work on with, with the music venue properties. So just, just to give a bit of um, context to that, um, Music Venue Trust, it is a charity that acts to protect, secure and improve UK grassroots music venues for the benefit of venues, communities and up and coming artists. You can tell that I just read that, can't you? But um, it represents over 900 music venues, which include the iconic ones such as uh, Club I for Back, Hull or Delphi, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, it did a lot of great work, yeah, really, really great work during, during the pandemic in representing music venues at a point where um, it could have, they could have easily have been uh, passed over when it came to funding distribution. And um, yeah, just just a really, you know, and I say this as, with my exchange hat on, I know I work for the organisation now, but like so much great support over the years we've received from MVT. And, you know, I think I really, I'm really glad to be part of that organisation now trying to sort of help move up things forward. So um, main issue, um, issues that we deal with, we often feel like they ultimately come back to the ownership of the venue, even when it's things like, um, you know, environmental sustainability, for example. Um, it quite often, you don't think that would be something to do with the ownership of the venue, but actually we, we do believe it is. And I'll just tell you why. So um, obviously 35% uh, of grassroots music venues closed in the last 20 years. And here's the main thing, 93% of grassroots music venues are tenants. And the average operator has less, less than 18 months left on their tenancy. And that is really where the big problem comes. You know, no, people aren't able to, unlike the exchange, for example, um, invest into accessibility, into environmental impact, into all of these important things, or even their programming, because ultimately they know that, um, well, they can invest in their program. That was a bad example. But yeah, they ultimately know that, in 18 months, that investment is just going to go into the pocket of their landlords who can use it to either put up their rent or look to sell the building on. So, as I said, they have different. Uh, I'm sorry, I've just uh, my computer's just got a bit funny. Are you still there? Yes. Oh, OK, great. OK, so, yeah, they have different motivations. Um, the majority of the crisis cases that we deal with are ultimately related to issues with the commercial landlords. And funding the purchase of property can be difficult for operators and cause succession issues. I mean, even in the case of the exchange, the thing I didn't mention with the share offer is that it really just took me out of the day to day. Like I had to essentially for nine months, you know, bring in somebody else to run the day to day because it was just so much work. And, um, you know, a lot of operators just aren't in a position to even consider doing something like that. So 
our plan was music venue properties, which I'm going to try to condense down really quickly. It's going to be a community. So it's a charitable community benefit society. It's looking to raise money through a community share offer. This is ongoing at the moment. Um, we've just passed the 50% mark. So we've actually raised 1.25 million so far. Um, and what we're looking to do with that money is to purchase the freeholds of um, nine different uh, pilot venues, we're calling them. Um, and what we will do then is rent them back to the, the operators on more favourable rates with longer term tenancies. And by and we will also look to make improvements to the buildings, being repairs and insurance contributions, which landlords at the moment just simply aren't doing. Yeah, that, that covers a lot of that. So yeah, people can invest from, from £100. Um, they can get 3% on their investment, which actually, uh, unfortunately, hasn't aged very well since we opened the uh, share offer um, in May. But I mean, you know, it is an ethical um, investment. Um, and this is what we're planning. Yeah, there you go. There is the process I just tried to sort of uh, to distill into a one minute um, explanation written down. So I'll leave that page up for a little while. Um, and yeah, just, just to finish off, I think I just wanted, you know, the idea of, um, who it benefits is not always the community, you know, when we think of that communities, quite often we think about them as being geographical, but in the, this case, it, you know, we see it as a community of, um, of interest of, and, you know, in our case, it's music. And we would, we talked a little bit earlier. I started it by talking about the music ecosystem and, and Terry talked about it beforehand. And, uh, here's a nice, um, little diagram that I really enjoy about the uh, live music ecosystem and the idea of all the different areas where people are basically seeing benefit from, um, from music venues and, and, and what have you. And the idea that, by saving them money on their rent, it will be reinvested into this into this world. So um, I'll leave that up for a little while, but um, I think I can wrap up my uh, whistles top tour of uh, <laughs> what I plan to say um, there. So and bring in some questions. I'm, I'm sorry if that's, that was very brief. I just I was conscious of, of time there. So I, I glossed over some of it. But some really um, inspiring things there. Um, I loved hearing about the exchange. I think I want to move in. Record shop, coffee, what more do you want? Um, we're very slightly over, but we're not going to go on for too much longer. Before we come to questions, I'll just give you some information about how to get started, because that's obviously a really important thing to know about. So I'll just do a little uh, screen share. Thanks very much, Matt. That's absolutely brilliant. So let me go to the right PowerPoint because I have two in my system. Uh, here we go. Getting started. Right. So I'm assuming <laughs> that quite a few of you, I hope you are, raring to go. Um, there's a brilliant tool that, uh, what's, what's happening there? Oh, I've started in the wrong place, actually. You're going to have to bear with me while I stop sharing and go back to the right no actually i'm going to whiz through okay close your eyes think 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 while i try and whiz through to the right place um there's a brilliant tool that co-ops uk have i've tried this out myself actually because once you're into a co-op you want to start about five thousand um and it's an online step-by-step -step tool so it takes you through the startup process um offers advice, information, guidance from testing your idea to registering as a co-op. And there should be a lovely link in the chat box, um, but I'm sure you'll also be getting that information afterwards as well. And this is a big one, business support. Um, joyfully there is on offer business support access of up to six days of tailor business support uh, you get a co-op development expert an advisor and they help you decide what's the most appropriate kind of co-op um, help you with governance um, supporting with the incorporation that's a registration process uh, developing membership criteria business planning you can't get enough help with business planning I think and uh, there can be skills training or peer mentoring so there's a really good range of things on offer there if you want to start a co-op and uh, and get some support and that's all from Cooperatives UK in partnership with the Cooperative Bank.
I'll start thanking everybody. And if anyone pops up with a question in the meantime, you're still in. Thanks for, thanks for bearing with us. We've gone a bit over, but we've had a few um, interruptions for Wi-Fi issues and various other things. Um, so a big thank you to everyone who's joined. I think it's a really exciting time for, for co-ops, for starting new ways of doing business, new ways of um, working in communities. Um, so it's been great to have such a large number of people. Um, I believe you will get sent a video so that if you want to watch it back, you can see it again. A uh, big thank you to Pat and to Matt, um, Cops UK for putting it on, Cooperative Bank, um, and everybody involved in the scheme to support new co-ops. Okay then. All right. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone.